Hello, everyone. In my language, you would say, my am, which means welcome. Today, I'm here to talk about my dad. A lot of you know the name Marbo. You know Eddie Marbo. But I grew up knowing a man who was completely different to what you know. He was a man who was passionate. He was a man who flogged us when we weren't good. But, you know, the era of the 70s, 60s, 70s, well, that was what you did. Because he had seven children. Out of the seven, I'm the middle. I had a brother and two sisters who were older, and a brother and two sisters who were younger. Now, being a middle girl, it's a bit hard. Because the fact is that your older sisters go, no, you're too young to hang out with us. And the younger sisters go, no, you're too old to play with us. I go, bugger. What am I going to do? <laughs> so what do you do? You go next to the neighbour. He's a little, he's a, he's a guy, but he didn't care. I could build a cubby house just like him. I could climb that tree faster than he did, and I knew how to fix a bike, and he didn't. Because all the all the things is when I was growing up at home, I was always left to do my own thing. Because my because uh, having seven of us, how do you you know, dictate time to each an individual child to make sure that they're good, that they're doing what they have to, and, you know, you know they're okay. Because mum and dad left me to do my own stuff, I developed my own personality and thought, you know what, I don't have to talk when all my siblings are talking, because you've got all these over here and all these over here, and I've got to sit here and listen. Long time I sit down and listen. My younger sister said, you were scary when we were growing up. And I said, why? She goes, you didn't talk. And I went, <laughs> I said, well, you know what? You guys did enough talking for me. I didn't have to talk. I said, I listened, I absorbed, and I made up my own mind about things. And so therefore, with that, you grow to be independent. And so, as I came, became 13, 14, 15, I started performing in a dance group. Because uh, I'm naturally a performer, as you can see. I, to, to talk to an audience, there's nothing. I can do that really easy. But um, when I was younger, I thought, I want to dance. So I went, joined this dance group. And my dad was all for it because, you know, it's learning and doing things that I like to do. Because he said to me, he goes, when I was 15, he goes, you've got to get into public speaking, and I reckon, real black for the way. That's gammon, Dad. A shame. They're going to get up and they talk to all the people. Shame. <laughs> but look what I'm doing. <laughs> it's not a shame for me because I'm talking about my dad and talking about how he shaped me into the person I was. And with, my, with that with my dad, it was that thing of... Everything he was doing to fight for native title, I watched. I asked my other siblings, did you ever watch Dad when he was sitting at the table in a haze of blue smoke? Because he'd sit there constantly smoking the cigarette, put it in his ashtray, and he'd be in the books. Glasses on, and he'd put it down, and he'd look at the door. And he'd go, oi, go to sleep. But how did he know I was there? <laughs> OK, I'll go back to sleep. But then every time... He'd be sitting there, I'd be watching. And I'd watch him. Some nights he'd be crying. He'd cry and he'd get up. He'd put the books down, put his glasses off, and he'd start singing. And he'd do a dance. And then he'd fall back into the chair into a heap and just put his hands over his face and just cry. Because it took a toll on my father. Because in 1992, we lost him. And to me, that was a great loss. Because he was just at his, the height of, of his passion. And for that to be taken away was really sad. But with how my father fought, he even fought when he was really sick. He used to walk around the yard hitting his hip, 
punching, literally punching himself, both sides. And we're going, what's wrong with you? He goes, oh, arthritis playing up. So you go and pop six Panadol. We're going, Dad, are we? Oi, oi, that's it. That's your limit for the day. You go, no, no, I'll go take them after. We go, oh, man, that's really not good. But he goes, but the doctor said it's arthritis. And then he went to a specialist. They said, no, let's, let's look into this arthritis. It wasn't. He had cancer. He was riddled in his hips with cancer. The cancer then went to his spine. He also had um, cancer of the throat. So he started talking in uh, this way. I remember ringing him up, making fun of him on the phone. Little did I know that was the last conversation I was going to have with my dad. But you don't know these things. If I knew then what I know now, I would redo things. But my dad is with me all the time. I just come from Murray Island. I went up there to do a, a show with the BBC and they were talking about land ownership. And I took Neil, got to get his name right now. I can't think of his last name for the moment, but I took him to my father's grave and I said, let me go in first. And I said to dad, I told my dad who he was and where he came from. And then I invited him into the space. I said, in your native tongue, please tell my father where you're from. And he did. And when he did, he said he had this warm sensation come over. He just sort of stood there. And I said, that's just my dad saying hello. Because when you acknowledge someone in the right way, things happen. Great things happen. And then when you sit in this space with my father, he answers all your questions. It's really good, because I go and sit. I sit for hours. You know, I take up too much of his time, but it's all good. Because, <laughs> you know, I paid a hell of a lot of money to get there, so I'm going to take my time. Because, you know, flights in Australia, they're not cheap. Especially going on the Torres Straits, man. And um, so while I'm there, I, I sit and I talk and I cry and I get him to give me the answers. Sometimes he doesn't give it to me straight away there. Sometimes I have to go to sleep and he'll come and answer my questions while I'm sleeping. But a lot of the things that my dad, with what he's done, he's, he, there's a lot of things he hasn't finished. And sometimes I, when I'm in the room talking to people about what he's done, it's like he's talking through me. Because people look at me really weird, but then they sit there and they're intense. Their eyes are just focused on me and everything I'm saying. And I'm going... I'll, I'll even say to them, excuse me, I, I said, if we're talking and, so, and, and I see this glazed look come over your face, I know Dad's taken over, but it's okay because I don't mind being the vessel for his voice because he has unfinished business. And if I'm to be part of how he solves his problem, so be it. Because a lot of the, a lot of the guys who are, represent the Torres Straits International um, Board, they seek my advice. And it's like... I'm a girl. What are you doing? They go, no, 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 no. But, you know, you know what your father was, was on about. You know, and I've sat for hours in the National Library going through his papers because it's like, well, to know my dad a bit more, I need to sit and have a look at these papers because that's him. And it's this thing of how do you understand a person if you don't really know that person? I knew him as my dad but I didn't know where his head was during this time of his fight. So I go and I sit with his papers and read. Read everything. Because I don't think there's a scrap of paper I haven't read. If I did, oh, I better go back and redo it. You know, it might take me a week to go through all 54 boxes, but hey, that's okay. That's just re-engaging with my father and with his fight and with his passion. And his words that are on the paper are so powerful. Because it was a man, you know, he never went to school. He only went to grade three. And then he, was, he had to stop to go and earn money for his family. And with doing that, he went onto a purling boat. Then he came back off the purling boat because he met the teacher who was teaching at the school at the time. And he got to... They did a collaboration. He, he said, well, if I teach you Meria Mer, which is the language of our island, you teach me English. He said, okay. So that was their, their way of compromising. 
So my dad learnt to speak English quite fluently. He kept telling us when we were growing up, oh, I can't speak good English like you. And I'm going like, Dad, you speak better than us. And he's going, no, no, no. And he'd always growl. Because we'd have, as black kids, we always chuck off. We'd always chuck off at everything. You know, we see a fella down the road there, and he's oh, fella walking, he's walking like this now. And, you know, and we come home, we're doing that. Dad just look at us and go, I don't think so. <laughs> Stop mocking and talk properly. Go, bugger. <laughs> you know, and then go, okay, all right. We'll make sure we articulate. Because how, how, cause he'd say to me, he goes, how are people supposed to understand you if you're not speaking correctly? I went, fair enough. Because one of the things was, he says, to get on in this world, we need to walk both sides of the road, but we need to be articulate on this side. Because people are, you're black, you're a woman, and if you want to be heard, you have to speak correctly. And so that was where my dad said, to, when he kept saying that to us when we were younger, I thought, that's really weird. But now it's paid off. And now it's that thing he instilled that we went to school, because he didn't go to school. One of the things that I found with, with um, Dad was because he had a yearning to learn, he, and he put that into us. But my way of learning is actually to sit with someone and actually having that chat. Because in the chat, you find out who people are because they drop their guard and they become real. And that's how, you know, with my dad, him becoming real to me was when we used to send that boat. Oh, man, so many coats of paint on that boat. He didn't like it. So, OK, we've got to sand it, strip it down again. Why? It's a nice, it's, it's finished. Nah. Because he was stressed, that was how he managed his stress. And I just happened to be the one that stripped that boat down. <laughs> that, that many coats of paint. Nah, don't like it. Strip it back again. So, and, you know, one of the things was, your dad's no shirt, he's just working in front of you. Autopsy report after my dad died. Said he had a big scar in the middle of his back. And I was thinking, he only ever had a scar at the top of his shoulder, where he told us the story of when he ran through the bush. Didn't have one in the middle of his back, but traditionally, my dad wasn't, he wasn't killed by Ashley cancer. He was, he was caught through traditional magic. Traditional magic because the only way we know that he was caught that way is because of what happened. How he became sick so fast and within six months. Within six months, you know, we lost him. And there's that thing of like, that's too fast. And then that's when we went, now we understand why he had that scar. Really weird. People who do wrong, they have a false thumb. When they meet you, they like patting your back, don't they? Because on the pat of the back, they're putting what they need to in you. A lot of people go, ah, that's a bit weird. But <laughs> when you actually see something happen or something happens to you, that's when you go, ooh, there is something out there. Many times things have happened to me, and I always go, okay. I understand this, I appreciate, I'll accept, but I'll also be on my guard. And with that, if they didn't do that, my dad would still be here. He'd probably be the one talking to you. But it's that thing of like, my dad, you know, he's a deadly man, and he was passionate. And he, with his passion, you know, there was no boundaries. He, he learnt everything and he appreciated people. And you know, one of the things that I remember the most about my dad is telling funny stories. One of the most, um, I thought it was amazing, because I'm all of eight, we're all sitting in the kitchen. There's seven of us, so he's got seven kids, we're all around this table, mum's sitting there, and she's knitting. Okay. Anyway, so we're all listening to the story, and it's about frogs. He talks about Frederick and Roderick, these two brothers. I'm going... Why? Why Frederick and Roderick? They said, that's the, well, you feel think of frog. He goes, Frederick, Roderick, Frederick, <laughs> Roderick. Oh, OK. So that's why they call Frederick and Roderick. OK. And so he gets into the story, but he, he starts saying it in language. And by the time he finishes, he goes, listen. And we're going, we're, we're all listening. And then we hear this frog outside. 
We're going, did you call that frog? He goes, no, 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 let's listen. The frog happened, and then it's like, man, it's loud now, how come? We open the window, and the backyard's just full of frogs. They've got that big sack, and they're all singing, Frederick, Frederick. <laughs> And we go, going, Dad, gee, you're deadly because you can talk to frogs. <laughs> and so that's when I, and like, I live in the house that my mum and dad bought. I live there now with my seven children. And, and with that, I don't do the frog story. I just sort of think, you know, I don't like frogs. <laughs> so I'll not do that story with my children. But I always, I always mention things to them about the sound they make. Because I go, can you hear Frederick and Roderick? And they go, what? I was oh, just a kid thing when I was growing up. But they now have an appreciation of when I tell them little things, I'm always talking about my dad. I'm so proud of my dad, I keep him alive and I always talk to him. That's why I'm here today, talking to you about my dad. Because I believe that he will be forever with us if we keep him alive and keep him in, in what we talk about. And it's a thing of like, if you think about what my dad has done, if you don't understand it or if you don't, not too sure, just Google. Google's an amazing tool. Just Google, put his name up there, have a look, you know. But if, you've know, if you know a little bit, you know, maybe in a break or something, and if you want something answered, I'm your girl for it. But it's that thing of, like, um, with what I do, I like to empower people because, and for me, Information's a fantastic tool. And I have a lot of information about my dad, but if you want to know about it, all you've to do is ask me. And thank you very much. <laughs>